All right, welcome to the next session. We're gonna hear from the founder of Snowfork, Aiden Maznitsky, who's gonna be talking about the Polkadot Ethereum bridge, which they've been uh, working hard at for quite a while now and is coming along very nicely. Uh, so definitely carry over a couple of the questions that you had for Tomas in the previous uh, uh, session, because he'll be able to answer them in, uh, in, a, in a lot of depth. So take it away. Cool. Hey, everyone. So I'm Aiden, and I'm from Snowfork. And we're building, as you all know, a Polkadot Ethereum bridge, which Thomas talked about. So I'll skip giving the high level overview because you've probably just all heard about that if you went to our talk. Um, but first, uh, to talk a bit about Snowfork. So Snowfork is essentially a collection of designers, developers, researchers, and, and product managers that work together and join up to form teams to work on different projects. And this year, our focus has shifted to, to Polkadot, and our main project has been to work on this Polkadot Ethereum bridge. Um, we've been working on it for a few months now, and it's coming along well. And over this talk, I'm going to give kind of an introduction and overview of the bridge, uh, what it means for end users and, and people that are looking to, to use it and to interact with Ethereum, and how we're doing and what you can look forward to over the next few months. So yeah, an Ethereum bridge. Um, essentially, uh, one of the things Thomas brought up in his last talk was talking about trust and trust minimization. And, and so you've probably heard, if you've been listening to a lot of the talks today, that a bunch of different bridge projects and ideas have come up. And one of the things that um, is relevant for bridge design is uh, the trade-off between between trust and cost and user experience of using the bridge. And there's different design patterns and use cases and trade-offs amongst these. Um, and so with Snowfork's Polkadot Ethereum bridge, which uh, our kind of goal for this is trust minimization. And so what that means is we want end users to not have to trust too much of any kind of validators or intermediaries to know that the bridge is going to work correctly and that their funds are going to be saved. Uh, and they should not have to have heavy trust in too complicated crypto economics or mechanisms um, or and the kind of set of things that they trust should be ones that are fairly simple and easy to understand. Uh, and so that's kind of our goal for the bridge and what we're really looking to differentiate with for the bridge. Uh, another kind of aspect of our bridge is that we want it to be general purpose. So a lot of bridges, bridges focus on just asset transfers um, and token transfers, but with a general purpose bridge, yeah, you get basic token transfer, transfer of Ethereum and ERC-20 tokens, but we also want it to be general to any kind of asset like NFTs or even new token standards and asset types that emerge. Uh, and then beyond that, um, the ability to send arbitrary data. So uh, on Ethereum, a lot of smart contracts are not just about assets, but there's stuff like insurance and DeFi going on, there's games and all other kinds of things. And so being able to transfer state back and forth from these applications uh, is, is an important goal of the bridge. And once that's unlocked, essentially what that allows is for hybrid cross-chain applications where you can have an application where part of the application lives on Polkadot, part of it lives on Ethereum, uh, and, and there's various different use cases for this. Uh, one is to scale. Um, so for example, some application may have um, a heavy computation portion of the logic that it wants to run on Polkadot because Polkadot can do it faster. Uh, another uh, purpose is to widen the communities. So instead of having um, applications purely running on Polkadot or purely running on, on Ethereum, a cross-chain application can allow the, the two communities that use the different applications to really interact with each other and interact within the same um, application rather than separate applications and separate forks. Um, and then uh, another kind of major use case we're seeing is existing Ethereum apps that want to expand their reach into the Polkadot ecosystem. Uh, our bridge is going to help enable that. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about our trust mechanism and architecture uh, to give an understanding of what it really means for end users. Uh, and so the core mechanism that our bridge uses is like client verification. And so what that means is that instead of um, there being a separate network or a set of validators or relays that need to be trusted, the uh, full light clients are implemented on both chains, both Polkadot and Ethereum. And so that means that on the Polkadot side of things, Polkadot, Polkadot checks Ethereum's proof of work, it checks Ethereum transactions coming in, it can accept events that in get included in Ethereum. And just like um, multiple people are running Ethereum nodes and different Ethereum nodes communicate to, to each other to check that Ethereum's progressing. We effectively have this like mini Ethereum node running within Polkadot on our power chain. And so it can do um, full light client verification of what's happening in Ethereum and can get almost as much certainty of what's happening on Ethereum as any other uh, real mainnet Ethereum node. And then similarly, the reverse applies on the Ethereum side where we're implementing a Polkadot light client that 
runs with an Ethereum and an Ethereum smart contract that gives you that same level of trust. Uh, and so what that means is uh, the protocol exists fully on chain. It's only implemented on an Ethereum and Polkadot. And so um, all the logic is on chain and uh, you only really need to trust that Polkadot is working correctly and that Ethereum is working cor correctly and that uh, the Polkadot is correct in order to trust the bridge. There's no uh, need for like heavy intermediaries. Uh, of course, there still needs to be some kind of relaying of data between Polkadot and Ethereum. And so there is the, the idea of a relayer, um, but the relayer is not someone that really uh, needs to be trusted. The relayer can be buggy, it can be uh, compromised, security may be able to be compromised and it's permissionless so anyone can run it. Uh, and so what that means is if you as an end user don't want to trust any relay, you can also just go and run the relay yourself uh, and not have to depend on anyone else. But obviously for good user experience, we want to implement um, a good relayer and an incentive mechanism for relayers to participate and to ensure like high availability of the bridge. So, so there is a relay component, which will be fully trusted and permissionless, um, and will have some incentives and rewards to incentivize kind of high uh, robustness and reliability and, and performance for the bridge. But as I said, these incentives are kind of an additional layer that are not, not core to the protocol, and they could be run from a nonprofit business or uh, under a, a user relationship or just people running themselves. Uh, then lastly, we are going to be uh, implementing the bridge as a parachain on Polkadot, which means we need parachain collator nodes. Uh, however, our parachain is going to be different to other parachains in that it's going to be based on DOT. It's not going to have its own token. Um, it may be permissionless. That some, there's some details still to be uh, defined there, but essentially, um, this it's going to be running as a system parachain. And, and so what we, what do we mean by that? Uh, a system parachain, this idea has been talked about a, a bit, and, and essentially there's the typical uh, Polkadot parachain auction system where people are bidding to get a parachain slot, but we're hoping that we'll be able to make a proposal to the com Polkadot community for our bridge to be run as a system parachain that's really considered a core part of the Polkadot infrastructure because we believe that bridging to Ethereum is pretty much a key part of the Polkadot uh, ecosystem and it's going to enable um, a lot of applications to integrate and move to Polkadot. Um, and so what that means is, is, as I said, it's going to be dot based with no token. And ideally, uh, we're hoping it will be funded via treasury proposals that essentially get the parachain up and running and have a sustainable funding model for the parachain. So, so where are we at today? Um, how are we making progress and, and what's our roadmap? So we've been working on this for a few months already. And so today at this point, we have an evolving uh, MVP. We have completed full two-way messaging and asset transfer and arbitrary state happening between Polkadot and Ethereum, um, but it's not running in a fully trust minimized state. So we're still working on the trust minimization components that I mentioned in terms of the Ethereum light client and Polkadot light client. The Ethereum light client is almost done. The Polkadot light client should be done in one to two months. And then lastly, uh, the parachain is going to support cross-chain messaging for other parachains, and those APIs should be done in one to two months. So what that means is in at that time point, any parachain on the Polkadot network will be able to hook into our bridge and start interacting with Ethereum uh, by using our bridge. If we look at our, our timeline, so I described today, we've got this MVP working on Polkadot testnet, uh, and our pallets and code base are all open source. Uh, towards late December, we're, we'll have our initial trust minimization up, and we'll be sharing kind of a working demo for end users to play with, and documentation, and ideas and tutorials for developers of other parachains and other Polkadot applications who want to integrate with the bridge. For late January, we are targeting a full testnet release, uh, basically having full running production ready, cross-chain messaging, and integration with other parachain teams ready on a testnet. And then late February is when we're expecting to be fully production ready for Polkadot. Obviously, the launch is dependent on Polkadot supporting parachains, which we're hoping will come in early next year, but we'll be ready to launch uh, in production as soon as parachains are supported on Polkadot and hopefully launch aside that so that once that feature is unlocked in Polkadot, uh, full interoperability with Ethereum will be unlocked at pretty much the same time. Uh, and so, yeah, um, that's just a quick overview of our project. For people that want to dig in and look into more details, you can see Snowfork's website there. Um, I recommend looking at the GitHub repo for the bridge project um, if you're more technical and want to look into the code or even try running stuff yourself. And next week, we're going to be releasing a, a full website with like a lot more details of the project, some documentation, um, and then uh, some soon after demo and tutorials. And so if you're interested in keeping in touch about that, I suggest you check out our mailing list. Uh, we post updates every month or so. And when we release, 
the full website next week and that will be sent out through the mailing list so subscribe today and you'll get ongoing updates for our progress with the bridge um and yeah that kind of covers the overview and the things i wanted to talk about on the bridge i think we've got maybe i'm not sure how much time do we have left uh i think we have time there's there's one good question here so we got time for one good question um it is how is Polkadot light client smart contract on Ethereum optimized for Ethereum's high gas cost? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I can peel the onion and get into that a bit. And so, yeah, most people are aware that Ethereum gas costs are quite high. Um, and so when it comes to doing something complicated, like verifying the entire consensus of Polkadot and Ethereum, uh, a kind of default implementation or straightforward implementation of that is um, not going to be gas effective and it's going to result in an overly expensive bridge. And so there's a need to optimize the protocol such that it can run on Ethereum. And so the way in which we're doing that is essentially Polkadot itself is going to have this additional component running called a gadget, which usually uh, Polkadot, Polkadot runs on proof of stake. So every block, a bunch of signatories sign the new block. But with Polkadot, new blocks are happening every 10 seconds or, or, or even quicker. And so that's too fast for Ethereum to, to process. And so uh, the additional thing that's going to be added is every few blocks, if we imagine, for example, one, every one to two minutes, a, those same Polkadot validators are going to produce a new set of big signatures in Ethereum signature format, which um, Ethereum uses a different hashing algorithm for its signatures, uh, which are purpose uh, optimized for Ethereum. And so once those signatures are produced every minute or two, we can go in and then only process those signatures in Ethereum, which are those signatures are specifically optimized for Ethereum. And they also have um, the same level of security as the core Polkadot consensus signatures. And so by, by processing those signatures, we get an optimized version of Polkadot light client validation for Ethereum. The kind of if you're interested in more details of that, our website will be up next week, which will dig into uh, like how that protocol really works and how we achieve um, that kind of optimization without compromising on security. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and like Aiden said, please check out the uh, mailing list and they'll have a website up in the next week or so. So all of this information will be readily available uh, for everyone looking to build or get involved. Thank you all. I'll see you in the next talk on Polka BTC.